Podcast. So excited that you have pulled up a seat to join us today, wherever you are, if you're driving to work or from work, or if the kids are screaming in the car, turn it up, put the volume up in the car, and let's listen to this fun podcast. I am so excited that Matt and I are here, and we're going to um, let you take a listen at one of our guests that we had on the different show recently, Megan Alexander. She is the Hollywood star, the correspondent on Inside Edition. How many of y'all have watched Inside Edition? Come on. Let me hear you, Matt. Now, ladies, if you're driving, don't take your hands <laughs> off the wheel. Put your hands yeah, up to, now. To answer her question. <laughs> uh, but Megan Alexander, as you mentioned, she's a news correspondent with Inside Edition. She's typically known for covering the red carpet at yes. these massive celebrity events. She uh, used to work here in San Antonio she was, she was a news anchor here in San Antonio. And, and she's written a book that I think is very insightful about the decisions that people make to stand up for their faith yeah. or simply live by their convictions. Yes, faith you in know, the spotlight. Faith in the spotlight is about a young lady that has made a decision that she is going to engage in the career path of her choice, which is you know to be involved in news media, yeah. which is not necessarily known as the most uh, you know faith-based environment. But she yeah. hasn't compromised her faith. She no. hasn't. She hasn't changed who she is to be where she wants to be. She's actually taken her faith and used it, as she mentions in her book, to create a space at the table. That's right. Uh, and so we thought that this conversation would be one that encourages you, and uh, we hope it does. So take a listen to Megan Alexander with Kendall and I, and we'll be right back after this. Thank you, Megan, so Thank much you, for joining us. Thanks for watching. Yes. Yes. Absolutely, we got to yes. keep up to date with what's going on. But, uh, you know, getting to Inside Edition, that's something that a, a lot of people, they see your success and they say, well, congratulations, you know, you're, you you finally got there, you got there so quick, but they don't really get to see the process yes. that got you there. The, you know, all the hours you worked, all the opportunities you took, all the days that you stayed up late and, and how you really pushed to get to that point. For people who want to get involved in media or be involved in the kind of career you have, what would, you, what would your first recommendation be? Yeah, gosh, well, I would say that the pace and the schedule is is unreal. You yeah. all know that I lived in San Antonio, Texas. Yes. Absolutely. 2005 to 2008, worked for Channel 5 here yeah. and had a regular wake-up call at 3 a.m. for the Correct. morning news. 3 yeah. a.m. Oh this was before gosh. kids. Was I did yeah. it willingly. Yeah. <laughs> You're up. Yeah. But, um, and I've worked holidays. I've worked uh -huh. Christmas Eve. You know, when breaking news happens, you gotta go. Uh -huh. And so I think probably the most important thing for people to understand is it's a major commitment. It's not a 9 to 5 job by any no. means. Yeah. But if you love it and you feel called to do it, you feel that it's God wants you to do. As we all know, media is incredibly impactful, yeah. so influential, yeah. and I want to be a positive influence. I want to be in the mix. I want to have a seat at the table as a believer in this influential industry, and I think yeah. we should. Well, yeah. Megan, how did you keep the faith in the spotlight? I mean, your book, Faith in the Spotlight, how did you come up with the title of this book and um, how to keep your faith in an industry where sometimes faith is push to the side. Absolutely. I got an email a couple of years ago from a pastor in Seattle and he said, Megan, I have a church full of young, ambitious women of faith. They have big career goals and dreams. They're terrified that they're going to need to compromise their values and their faith to get where they want to go. He said, I have few women to point them towards in your industry, but I've heard of you. Would you come speak to these women? And I'd been thinking about this for a while. And that was really the moment where I said, I got to write this book. I'd gone to the Christian bookstores and I find myself in the business section or in, mm -hmm. you know, the personal development section. And yeah. I didn't find a lot of books for working women mm -hmm. that want to stay true to their faith and yet are trying to figure out what that means and what that looks like. So the book's very practical. It's finding a mentor. It's negotiating a salary. It's, um, you know, as a woman covering the NFL, what do you mm -hmm. do in a male dominated situation? Um, body image, yes. all sorts of things that we're up against that I think translates to any industry. But I, I need to figure that out too. I'm still yeah. figuring oh, that yeah. out and processing. Process. It. Yeah. It's a learning process, and I pulled in a lot of people that are further down the road than me, people like Michael W. Smith, Devon Franklin, Roma Downey, and Mark Burnett yeah. to contribute. Well, and, and, you know, those contributions come with wisdom from experience, and, yes. and there's times where, you know, fathers will come in to my office with their teenage daughter and she wants to be an acting or she wants to be a model. And, and, you know, those are wonderful things if that's something that God really has opened up an avenue for them to do. But I think it's important for people also to be aware of the, the conflict that they're going to find when they pick that road. Yeah. 
it's not that the world is necessarily against them. It's just that the world they're walking into might not be the one that they see. Yeah. Did you ever have that kind of, you know, epiphany where you, what you started out for and then what you actually encountered were two totally different things? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There were no classes in college that prepared me for this industry. Yeah. I'll give you a quick story. Um, I was on set filming an independent film a couple of years ago, and I'd gotten the script beforehand, I was playing one of the lead characters, and the film ended with a romantic scene, and it was looking into each other's eyes, going in for a nice hug. Yeah. That was in the script, that's what we were rolling with. We're on set, everyone's staring at us, and after one take, the director called Cut, yeah. and he walked over Bait and, and, he, switch. and he said, Megan, <laughs> let's just push it a little more. Why don't we do this, why don't we do that? What do you do in those moments? I, I didn't have time to call a friend. I didn't have time to call my pastor. You didn't have time I to check it with your husband. No. Yeah. I, I literally closed my eyes and said, Lord, just help me. Yeah. What are you going to do in those moments? And so that's what I try to tell the young people is let's talk about those scenarios beforehand. Parents, ask your daughter what she would do if she was in that scenario. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. End of the story is I said, no, I like it the way it is. Mm -hmm. I want to stick with what we have that, in the script. The yeah. Being yeah. aware that he could have gotten mad at me and he could have like fired, fired me. Yeah. And he pushed again and I said, no, I'm really good with what we have. And after a while he went, okay. And then went back over and yeah. the movie ended. It ended. So it's okay to stand up for what you believe in and it may end up not being as big a deal as you think or there could be a serious consequence, but what are you going to do in those moments? Yeah. At the end of the day, how are you going to feel about yourself? And, and there's so many different examples, even in the Word of God, of young people faced with similar situations. You go to Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. You go to Daniel. You go to Joseph. You know, they had compromising moments. And in the moment, what would have been the consequence? Yeah. But because they decided that they were going to stand up for what they believed in, they're basically influential for generations. Yes. And, and you haven't compromised your influence. Well, and I would just offer encouragement that I really think people are more supportive than we realize in media. Mm -hmm. I really have felt in the long run that people are figuring out that they don't have their moral compass yet. They're still figuring it out. Mm -hmm. And so I've actually been pleasantly surprised that people are more supportive of me standing up for what I believe in. And they go, Okay. Yeah, we, we'll accept that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Tell us also in your book, you're talking about purity, which I think is such an important topic yeah. for these young girls now that are growing up in a society where it's okay, you know, purity, go ahead, yeah. you know. You were talking about, you know, you didn't compromise on film for a number of reasons, but there's a lot of young people that feel like if they're going to gain the position that they desire, they're going to have to compromise in some other way, exchanging their purity for a job, exchange, you know, I mean, yeah. at what point do, do you decide, no, this is not, this is not something that's going to happen? Yeah. You want to silence a New York City newsroom? Talk about abstinence. People yes. didn't know what to do oh, with that. Absolutely. <laughs> like, yeah. They just looked at me like, oh, people still do that? Yeah. Um, you know, it was a decision I made in high school, went to a Christian high school in Seattle, Washington, had wonderful role models, grades above me. Mm -hmm. And I was really proud of my high school. They brought in an alumni couple once that was very candid and real about what that means, yeah. how they set their boundaries. And I remember it was a little bit uncomfortable, but being so grateful that they would go there mm -hmm. and they let us ask them anything. And so fast forward down the road, my husband and I made that decision. He came to the faith later in life and then made that decision with me. And we just thought, well, this is great for us, yeah. but we'll probably never talk about it publicly. Our yeah. family and yeah. friends know. Well, a pastor in New York City called me one day and said, a friend of mine wants to put someone on the cover of a Christian magazine that believes in abstinence. She can't find anybody in entertainment, <laughs> yeah. but I offered you, would you want to do this? And I, I said, yes, but let me call my other half here and yeah. see what he thinks. And so I called my husband and he said, Meg, if it encourages one person, yeah. it's yeah. worth That's it. Right. Right. So we did that, which led to the idea to put the chapter in my book. And I actually got mixed reactions on if I should did put you? this in the book. And yeah. I said, you know, I want to put it in because it's a part of my story. Yeah. It's who I am. I, I want people to know that People still believe in abstinence, yes, it, right. that it worked for me, it can work for you. It's been a great choice for us. And I have been pleasantly surprised. A lot of people say, have you gotten a negative reaction when you start talking about abstinence or made fun of? Sure, there's a little of that, but the majority has been people going, that's oh, awesome. that's cool. Yeah. Good for yeah. you. My boss um, up in television, who's not necessarily a believer, he's a father. He's got daughters. And he said to me, good for you to stand up for your values and yeah. be proud of who you are. So the reaction has been overwhelmingly positive, And the funnest part has been the person that pulls me aside and says, 
I'm waiting too. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking about it. I didn't think anybody was doing it anymore. Yeah, well, and the thing about that challenge is that you're having an uncomfortable conversation because the majority of people just want to pretend like it doesn't exist. Yeah. It does exist, yeah. and, and it's not just an entertainment industry um, question. It is a life question yeah. that the more people understand, look, you know, abstinence is a choice that you make based on godly values and biblical morals, and, mm -hmm. and the benefits and the dividends of making that choice are so much better mm -hmm. than the alternatives, you know, and, and you sit there and, and you talk to people who didn't make that choice, and I've never met anybody that, you know, chose abstinence that regretted it later. Yeah. You know, and I've met people who haven't chose abstinence that are sitting there going, well, I wish I would have. And then they fill in the blanks with not engaged in this relationship or not been involved in that yeah. situation or, you know, saved myself until I met my true love, those kinds of things. And it also has led to really neat conversations about just valuing each other and respecting mm -hmm. each other. Devon Franklin had a, has a book out called The Weight and he contributed to my book and I thought he did such a nice job laying it out, which is why I asked him to mm -hmm. contribute to this chapter. But it, it brings us back to, well, as I'm dating somebody, am I respecting them? Am I valuing them? What's the end goal? What's the long-term goal? It yeah. gets us thinking long-term. We're so in the moment nowadays yeah. and yeah. instant yeah. gratification. Yeah. So I've really enjoyed the, the bigger conversations that it pulls out in people. It's an mm -hmm. opportunity to think about who am I really? Who do I want to be in this world? And how, how do I, I want to treat impact the people? people? Yes. Yeah. How do I want to impact people? Uh, you know, back to faith in the spotlight. Faith is something that, especially Christian faith, in the world that we live in today, it seems to be one of the only things that it is okay to openly oppose, and it's popular. You know, if you stand up for something, typically you're standing against something else. Uh, but the one thing that you hear people often say is, you know, well, they, they take a position against faith, and nobody speaks up. How do you feel that the role you're playing in the entertainment industry as a person of outspoken faith kind of meets on the front lines of that situation and says, hey, there are some ambassadors for the kingdom that are engaged in entertainment. You know, you mentioned it as a seat at the table. Yeah. You know, how, how do you feel that this role is something that God's called you to do? Well, first of all, my approach that I personally believe in is we've got to do excellent work first to get that seat at the table in the first place. Fabulous. I, I didn't yes. talk about... So glad to hear you say that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I didn't talk about my faith early on either. Number one, because I honestly just wanted to do a good job and put my head down and yeah, not yeah. get fired. <laughs> but I I really think respect for other people, do a good job. I know at the end of the day, when I started talking about my faith, I really believe a lot of my friends in the industry were like, oh, well, good for Megan, yeah. but we know she'll deliver deadlines. Exactly. We'll know she do, she'll do good on that story yeah. with us, and she's a good reporter and a good writer. Yeah. So do good work first to get the respect to have that seat at the table in the first place. And then, you know, it's a, so much of it is respecting each other. I work with people from different lifestyles, different religions, yeah. different thoughts in my industry. I appreciate their views and That's what right. they bring to the table, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. And I hope that because of that, they then allow me to share mine and have an opportunity yeah. to interact. I think so much of it is approaching it with compassion, not picking fights, going about it well, in a respectful way. Yourself. Absolutely. You know, and, and in the whole context of love your, love your neighbor as yourself, a religious person asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And, and he basically is saying in this story, the person who is your neighbor is the one that you least expect it to be. Absolutely. You know, the one who is totally against you, the one with whom you have the most stereotypical prejudices. You're yeah. supposed to love that person the same way that you love yourself. And, yeah. and, you know, with regard of doing good work first, I'm reminded of, of Daniel again in his life. He did not work for godly men. He worked in a pagan land. He yeah. worked in several different administrations with global leaders who were less than Baptist deacons. And yet every one of them said, there's a spirit of excellence in you. You know, when they needed something done, they could count on Daniel to do it. And they didn't mind Daniel's beliefs that were contrary to theirs because he delivered in what he was, attempt, what, what he was assigned to do. Yeah, you know, exactly. when you put excellence as your, your front runner, that builds a reputation of, of accountability that, you know, basically it doesn't matter what industry you're in, the world will find value in you. Absolutely. Right. Actions speak louder than words. If your work speaks for itself. Yeah. Completely agree. And we need this in all industries, don't we? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, re I really think if everybody approaches their work, you know, one of my favorite verses, Galatians 6, 5 through 6, which is, you know, make a careful exploration of the work you have been given and then sink yourself into that. Whatever your passion is, whatever you're good at, be excellent at it. 
because you never know how that will impact the kingdom. If we're all doing that, so much can be done. Well, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Megan, you are indeed Thank letting you your so light shine. You, Thank you, Kendall. Thank you. Love your show. You know, Megan is certainly an example to a lot of young women yes. about the power of choice. She made a decision that she was going to save herself until marriage. Now, it, that really doesn't have anything to do with her career field. No. But there's a lot of young people that feel as though... Uh, that decision, I, I've even heard it from some of the young people uh, that, you know, we have in our youth group and things. That's impossible. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of folks in the world today that want young people to believe that's impossible, but it's not. It, it's a choice. And, and it's a choice that Megan made, and it was a benefit in her life and in her marriage. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that was something that really stood out in the conversation we had is that no matter, you know, where she went, the opportunities that she had in her career, she maintained her values and she stood by her convictions. Yeah. Also with her talking about taking a seat at the table, you know, she was um, not going to compromise her faith, but she wasn't just going to throw it out there. She said that, you know, be excellent in what you do first and then let them see the light in you. Then they want to know more about your Jesus. And that oh, really, I, I thought that was such a me. Yes. strong part of the conversation because a lot of times people want to lead with their faith, which believe me, faith is obviously everything. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But when you walk into a business meeting, if you begin this business meeting and, and the purpose of it is to accomplish a project and you start with, I'm a Christian, well, all due respect to that statement, how does that get us any closer to the, the conclusion of our project? What does that do to create success for us? Yeah. If you walk into a business meeting and you say, these are the things that I can contribute to this project and you deliver, then people are willing to listen to you when it comes to your faith okay. because you've done something of value and excellence first. You know, when she was talking about, you know, do good work. You know, be yeah, somebody that's be, dependable. Be you know, don't say I'm a Christian and then show up 15 minutes late. Don't say I'm a Christian and then ask for an extension on your deadline. Don't say I'm a Christian and, and do mediocre stuff and, and use your faith as an excuse. You know, do good work first and then allow your faith to be shared once you've earned their respect through the work that you do. There was a lot of great insight there with Megan, and uh, I hope that it encouraged those of you who got a chance to listen to it. Now, for all of you soccer moms who took your hands <laughs> off the wheel earlier, uh, if you're going to take your hands off the wheel again, Kendall, tell them how yeah. they can direct message Park us. Park your car and correspond with us by DMing, giving us a um, DM direct message. Yes. Tell us about um, what you thought about this podcast. Tell us also about some different um, people that you would like to have on the podcast. That you'd like to listen to because we want to hear your comments. Subscribe. And if you'd like to get the audible uh, version of Faith in the Spotlight or pick up a copy today, Megan Alexander was a great conversation for Kendall and I, and I know that uh, she's got some content that'll be a blessing to you. Subscribe to the podcast, and we look forward to seeing you soon.